Hi, everyone. And uh, this is one of the most exciting opportunities I've had in a long time. We're in Wetzlar, Germany, in the Leica store, amazing facility. And I'm sitting here with Dr. Andreas Kaufman. And I can call you Andreas, is that correct? Mm, absolutely. And uh, there's quite a story here. You're, are, your title now is? Oh, the German title is, et cetera, I believe that I'm the chairman of the supervisory board. Okay. Because in Germany, uh, we have this two-tier system, so we have the supervisory board. Okay, great. Now, many of our viewers, almost anybody in photography, will certainly have heard of Andreas and Dr. Kaufman's work and commitment to the Leica brand. And we're going to talk about photography, history, and a whole bunch of other things. And I'd like to kind of start out and go back with the Wayback Machine. Um, to your early history, um, and somewhere along the line you were given a camera. Yeah, and, and the funny thing is we were never spoiled. So I got a camera which was used in the German Democratic Republic. It should have been the Volkskamera of the German Democratic, but they exported it usually. <laughs> so it was a Penti uh, produced by Pentacon Optische Werke Dresden, which was formerly a, a, a Zeiss operation, etc. Very funny thing, very 50s, but I got it uh, end of the 60s and uh, started with a few rolls of uh, black and white film. And it was, it was half format, so 1824, and I didn't understand that too. So it was pretty interesting. <laughs> And, and uh, I bet the optics were really good on that one, too. <laughs> no, they were really horrible. Uh, Maya, it was a Maya Gerlitz f3.8. I still have the camera. Um, and uh, the result was sort of so-so. So it was kind of a tr tradition along the way that you, you, know, you get a camera and you, know, you practice a little bit about photography. And uh, you went to college for what kind of interest? Oh, um, I studied at uh, University of Stuttgart, um, German literature and political sciences. So um, it was a bit different. And in between, sometimes you did take pictures with whatever you had, the uh, Kodak Instamatic or something like this. Yeah, so um, snapshots. But you got your first taste of Leica and you know photography in general because you. Um, we're, you were dating somebody that was a photography apprentice. Tell me a little bit about that. So, actually, she was my girlfriend from school, and she went into the apprenticeship. So, as a, as a photographer, photo photomeister, uh, was with a title after a title afterwards. Um, and um, I, I told this story a few times because it's really somewhere. Um, engraved. Uh, so she came back, um, we met, and she said, look, "Look what I have here." Yeah, I said. Oh. Uh, camera. <laughs> so she looked at me, she was a beautiful blonde. Um, look what look what I have here. I said, you know, as long as I look at it, it's still a camera. And then she looked at me like this and said, it's a Leica. <laughs> Even <laughs> and then I added, and that probably was not good. I said, that's a camera too. <laughs> so, and she looked at me like this, and half a year later it was over. <laughs> Maybe not completely related, but um, so. I always remember from this time, obviously for a photographer, a Leica was something that, oh, this is a Leica, and I, I thought, oh, it's a camera. Well, it's a, it's a camera that, you know, I've, I've had many Leicas in my day, and, you know, there were a camera of, as I was a youngster that I aspired to. You know, I, I, I had to get my Leica, and I had to get a Hasselblad. I mean, there were certain cameras that were so iconic in the, the Photography at the time that it, that's why you you, you 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 say that there's all and it's interesting and there, I don't think there's another camera around that drives a passion, you know, kind of like that red dot and and Leica. You're probably right and and I've, I've, I've first my, my first Leica I acquired was 2004, the year when we entered into Leica, not before because for me being you know a, a pure amateur you just had a simple camera and the Leica was always since these days something, you know, uh, inspirational. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, you actually ended up aspiring to a Leica in the end anyway, so. <laughs> so it was an MP and, 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 you know, as a Leica, you, 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 you never throw a Leica away. So I still have it. My son uses it now. Ah, that's great. You know, you never <laughs> throw them away. That's a film camera. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's getting to be popular again. Yeah, yeah. So tell me a little bit about your family history. You, you, um, you're, you were 
from Austria, and you were, your family had a background in paper packaging? or in uh, We have a very complicated background because we're from Austria and Germany. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so the Kaufmann family usually were um, citizens of Frankfurt, but my grandfather left in 1905. And the other part of the family, they came from what was formerly uh, the Austrian Empire. They came from Bratislava, uh, Pressburg. And somewhere in between, somewhere between Berlin, Vienna, etc., they met. My father was born in Berlin. He would have nearly been born in Boston. Oh, nearly. Yeah, because my <laughs> grandfather at this time was um, with the Bo Boston uh, Symphony Orchestra. Uh, before the First World War, okay. <laughs> a few days ago. But then my grandmother, when she became pregnant, told him, we have to go back. I don't want my son to be an American. <laughs> okay, so she had, yeah, because right. born in the yeah, US, yeah, yeah. yeah. So maybe my, my father would have liked it, I don't know. <laughs> but That's your father. Grandmother <laughs> okay, so my father was born in Berlin, and so, so it's a mixed history between Germany, Austria, and the rest of the world. <laughs> So, you know, yeah. somewhere along the line, though, you, you the, yes, your family heritage moved along here. Uh, you got involved with your brothers in something. And, uh, well, um, we, uh, the, the family background was a company which was later called Franschach AG, hard to pronounce, I, I know. Um, and it was our family company, formally called differently before the Second World War. It was founded in 1903. Um, we had to sell it. For in those days, it was called due to political reasons in 1938 because part of the family was half Jewish. Um, and we got back part of it in 1950 and so on and so forth. So this was the industrial background, but we sold the last remaining shares, 30%, in 2004 to a company to whom we already have so had sold the other part of it. And it's nowadays, the, the company still exists. It's called Mondi. It's a South African company listed okay. in, uh, in London. And uh, nowadays has a, a turnover of 6 billion euros. Ooh. But in 2004, you and your brothers got together and um, you discovered Leica somewhere along the line. Well, that. We, we, we set up a, a sort of um, holding company in 2002 called ACM, A for Andrea, C for Christian, M for Michael. <laughs> That's the explanation. <laughs> okay. uh, um, to invest into Germany, because in those days, the German industry seemed to be a little bit depressed, actually quite depressed. And we said this is a good opportunity to enter into it because uh, the prices were totally different uh, compared to today. So we started 2002. First company we bought, Vella Feinwerk Technik, which was formerly a department of Leica. Okay. And um, we have this company since today, 75%. And that's how we came to Wetzlar. In 2003, we bought another company um, in, this, uh, in 2003 from Leica called Via Optik. It's over the place okay. here, um, helped it to restructure. In 2004, uh, we bought into Leica. So tell me about the Leica adventure. What did you find when you, you decided to take over Leica? You know, I'm sure you dove in head first. Well, <laughs> the good thing in life sometimes is that you don't know what you're getting <laughs> into at the beginning, okay. because maybe then you wouldn't do certain things. <laughs> so um, it, it, Leica, it was quite simple. Leica had a very prestigious shareholder. Hermes International, the Hermes, the true luxury company. So we said, boah, Hermes is a shareholder, safe bet. Safe bet. It wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then a few things we, we found out and then was very clear. First uh, restructuring, so we had 11, 12, 13 elements of a restructuring between 2005 and 2009. Pretty busy, that's a lot of restructuring. There, was always, there were always good people at Leica, great ideas, but sometimes execution was not always there due to restrictions financially. And don't forget the first digital revolution. Leica showed the first digital camera already in 1996. And the first consumer camera together with a Japanese company, with Fuji, in uh, 1998. But it was unclear where does this go end there was a technical problem because up until a certain time you could not change the M system into digital. That had to do with the way sensors were built. It had nothing to do that the company was not able to do it, 
but the technology was not there. So and after 2004, in 2005, suddenly, due to the development in sensor technology, it was able to do a digital M, which was always the backbone of the company. Yeah, that was quite an announcement. Uh, you took everybody by storm that year. We can all remember it. I got in line and, and ordered we, my first And, and we had definitely a learning curve there. Sure, yeah. sure. I mean, there so, was... by the way, they set up the digital department already in 1994. So they looked into that, but they were not sure what to go. So uh, to create the development, to um, work together with other companies, we started working together with a company to develop ASICs, that means the specified processors for cameras. So we're now in the pipeline with Maestro 2 and uh, somewhere in the future with Maestro 3. We can specify this, so, but we had to learn this. So there was this sort of interim situation, 2004 to 2007 or so, when you had to do certain things, but the people were there, the ideas were there, and that was quite helpful. You've invested an awful lot to make like where it is today. So that didn't come without a vision. So tell me a little bit about the vision that you saw. You know, you, you're involved, you probably could have sold it if, right again if you didn't really believe in it, but there's something that got you. You believed in it, you saw it, and you had a vision. So tell me about how you saw things going. The ideas of the people involved, they were quite there. And on the other hand, the reaction of people, you know, when I first traveled to Japan, yeah, 2005, uh, related with Leica, and the reaction of, uh, the reaction of certain Japanese, oh, Leica, yeah? uh, so you saw there is something created which is there. And you only have to deliver certain things that uh, the expectation in the product matches only. <laughs> A few other things. <laughs> oh, quite a few other things. Yeah. Because you asked for the, the vision yeah. was quite clear. This company can become bigger and can also play a certain role in the camera optics sector. That, that, that was quite clear and we had to find out which way to go. We're sitting here in this beautiful yeah. building, this beautiful facility. Yeah. Uh, uh, you're building a great uh, facility across the street too in Leica Park 3. Um, but you now have a, a lot of cameras, yeah. uh, different kinds of cameras, and they're bold cameras. They're, obviously, we've got the, you know, the, the beautiful M10, yeah. but it, it goes even Funny further. We have something like this, where yeah. some people thought, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> it, it's, well, because you know, yeah. there's no labels. We've talked yeah. to everybody about the whole philosophies. Yeah. The buttons have gone away. Yeah. You know, less is more and all the things. Some amazing things going on. But um, you know, this, this is certainly making a lot of attention in the field. But one of the things that I, I find interesting is this is not necessarily a luxury brand anymore. You wouldn't consider this a luxury brand. So well, uh, well, I have a very simple answer to this, to this because um, our prices were always luxurious, but due to a reason. So the first Leica which came on the market that was two and a half times uh, the, the monthly income of a German employee. And an M system with a standard lens nowadays is more or less the same. So, <laughs> so it's it always the prices were always luxurious, but due to a certain reason. So, I wouldn't call it exactly luxury industry because it's not so much um, applying certain material or something like this. But the way how we do it, and don't forget, we're also a small scale producer. So, we, we a different type of how we have to do things, and certain things we can't do because we, it doesn't make any sense to make it cheap like a camera. My personal view of Leica is always, it's, it's between two, you could call it between two poles. One is tradition and the other is revolution. And somewhere in between. So some people might not see this. For instance, the X1, which we showed 2009, was the first consumer APS-C camera. But it looked like a tiny little uh, Leica camera from 1925. Uh, later on, our respected Japanese competitors came with that com, uh, concept too. Nowadays, basically, the, the key entry-level or high-end entry-level camera is an APC camera. Yes. We showed this 2009. I still think that the concept we showed in the S is undervalued because it's a medium-format camera in a body of a DSLR. Mm -hmm. Only the lenses are bigger because it's medium-format. We showed this already 2008. We are still basically the only producer of a black and white camera with a true dedicated monochrome sensor, short first, yes. 2012. So we do sometimes things, things because we think we should do it. 
And that could be, you could call this a little bit of the revolutional part, but on the other hand, the long tradition of how a picture should look like, yeah. how optics should work, uh, that, that would be the traditional part, although optics in, in itself is not tra very traditional. It's quite advanced. Quite advanced. And you must have had to learn an awful lot about optics coming into this, because what we've learned over the last few days are just amazing. First off, you know, the lenses can be put on any camera. And well, um, the, the M system uh, is, as our core system, is a pretty interesting system because you can basically use every lens since 1954 on it. And it still works. There, there are two or three exceptions, but uh, when you count it through, it's probably 120 different lenses or so over the time. Okay, but the M is a camera for a dedicated shooter because it's, it has a bit of a snobistic appeal. You know oh, why? For sure. It's like, you know oh, why? Yeah. Because with an M you say, I know how to take pictures. Because it's complicated. Yeah. yeah? But it's fun to take pictures yeah, with an sure. M. You know, it's, it, my experience with it is, you know, I've had a number of M's in my day, yeah. and then for a while I, I went away from it, and then got back into the M8, and uh, I had the opportunity to test one of the first M10s in New yeah. York City when it came available. Okay. And it was like, oh, how am I supposed to talk about this? You know, there's no autofocus, there's none of yeah, this, and yeah, not that. Yeah. And it took me a little bit of time to acclimate myself. And then all of a sudden it became fun because I got back to photography. That's I got the point. back to focus, huh? f-stop, exposure. Uh, uh. You know, I walked into Grand Central Station and I started becoming, you know, what I always wanted to become, a photographer again. Yeah. I, I, for instance, love to shoot when I drive with a taxi in, 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 in foreign cities. But with an M, you can do all the settings that you're so fast for this shooting. Try to do this with an autofocus camera or even with your smartphone. You're always too late. But yeah. with the M, you can anticipate, you do the settings, you have to know what to do. But then it works quite nicely. It does. It's, um, it's a marvelous experience. And, uh, you know, you kind of reach the pinnacle with the M10. Um, you know, the, this was you know, where the rewind dial was, and you know to be able to yeah. put the dials up to have all the things yeah. that you need. You know when you look down, yeah. um, you've taken video out. I mean, there's a lot of decisions that had to be made yeah. uh, on this. There's no taking taking video out was a bit of a hard part because nowadays everybody says we need video, which for professions is true, but we have other other solutions for that, like the SL or the TL2, which creates also create video stream. But here was a very clear decision, okay, we keep it out, it's pure still photography. So where do you play in the decision uh, making parts of this, you know, with the cameras? Uh, you're aware of what's going on, are you offering guidance and direction along the way? I mean, how does this work? I listen to employees, yep. their ideas, and sometimes I help them to get this idea out. Sometimes I force them into things. For instance, a product like the Leica Now, Leica Sofort, yeah, based on the Fuji systems, we wouldn't have done it before because it's, some people would say it's a cheap plastic camera. <laughs> yeah. But it's the only true analog camera in a, in a new way. Yeah. So um, it did take a bit to convince our people that we should do it. <laughs> so sometimes I talk about ideas. Let's go back to the APS uh, size um, camera for a yeah. minute, and then I want to talk a little bit about the SL, because this, this is, I think this is a major big step for you. Absolutely. So you believe in the APS, and you've, yeah. you've had a couple varieties of it, um, and the, the recent introduction of the uh, TL2 is, uh, I think, uh, a, a huge step. It's so different. It feels so different when you hold it. Yeah. And yeah. Um, even the, the new CL is incredible. Um, a lot of boldness goes there. <laughs> well, for instance, um, what we did here is also a bit of a revolution in, self, in itself, uh, how you build cameras. Because usually you have in, in the camera inside what we call a chassis. A chassis. Yeah, yeah? Yeah. Uh, which is usually Magnesia or something okay. like this. And here was the decision, we do everything from the outside. So you don't need anything inside, and you can mill this from a block of aluminium. Yes. So um, it's a different way of how you can build cameras, because if you 
this, this is probably not for us because we are a small scale producer, but if you could go further and say, okay, we have the outside part and then you shift just everything into it, would also change the way you produce things. The, the, the TL started with a different idea in 2010, actually. In 2010, we had a project with a, with a Taiwanese laptop producer. We looked into a certain product. How would that work together with a camera system? And from then on, we had this idea, what would happen if you create a camera which is completely touchscreen driven? That started already 2010 mm -hmm. as, a, as an idea, but then it did take a bit because the touchscreens were not there and also the processors available were not there. So, and then came the first TL, which was a huge step ahead, but um, one or two things were still a bit slow due to a, a certain technology you had at this time. I think the TL2 is now completely there, that you say, for traveling, producing high-end pictures, great video, using APS-C system is the way to go. At the moment, I'm traveling lightly, and I have this with me. Yeah. <laughs> The, the menu systems, too, one of the things that we noticed as we were going through here is with a lot of camera makers, it's one of the, the banes of their existence is, you know, putting in menus are so complicated. One of the things that Leica has done so well is, you know, put in great menu systems. And with the TL2, you have gone into a tile menu system, yeah. completely new and different. Yeah, yeah. That's a huge shift. It is. It is not seen as a, as a revolution in the camera industry. We don't forget, most of the competitors are Japanese companies. Yeah. And they do cameras like they did and add some electronics to it. But the second digital revolution which we're in will change that too. And this is a part of it. And in the APS-C system, we decided to go twofold. This is from the design and from the menu, basically the revolutionary type. And the CL, it also has basically nearly the same dimension like the Leica 1, and it has what's called the battleship design. Yes, it and this is for the more traditional shooter who wants to have everything you with dials, etc. And I think it shows what you can do in the APS-C system, in this direction and that direction. Well, we, we got a chance to talk to the, the product manager and we got to talk to, to the designer. And it was funny when you know, it was kind of hidden in a box and yeah. you know, we've signed our life away with blood and everything <laughs> else. But yeah. uh, when we looked at this camera yeah. for the first time, it was like, yeah. I saw that downstairs in the case. Yeah. It's very simple. We have at Leica basically three basic designs, which we always try to adjust to the certain times. It's the design of the Leica one because you can't do it better, basically. <laughs> you can add a few things, etc. It's the, an SL design, the Leica Flex design, which has some elements still here, and it's the M design. These are the three elements which we try to develop through, uh, through let's say, the century. <laughs> well, uh, my, my hat's off to you on the APS side, especially yeah. with the uh, TL2 and the, and the CL. Uh, it's, it, it does bring back retro, the, the design with uh, buttons and dials and some of the different yeah. things that it, it executed, and to be able to finally put a viewfinder in, in yeah. APS, uh, I think, is a big step. It's yeah. a brilliant yeah. looking camera. Now you have two different bodies, but they yep. use the same lens system. Yes. Yeah? And you can use this lens system because the mount you developed here, we already had the SL yep. in mind. This mount will also, this has much more opportunities than you see here at the moment. Um, you will hear something next year regarding this. <laughs> oh, we'll be back. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, I can't say anything, no, no, but we will, okay. show, we will tell this in June 2018. Oh, excellent, cool. So let's move on to this camera, the uh, SL. And boy, what a camera this is. And it's, uh, oh, first off, let me compliment you. Yeah. For, and I have all the engineers, the fact that you saw the future. You decided to make uh, a full frame uh, mirrorless, mirrorless yeah. camera. This idea was inside the company since four or five years already. The key thing to make it mirrorless was especially the resolution of the viewfinder, which formerly you couldn't do. It's still the highest yeah. res viewfinder yeah. to my knowledge. It's yeah. what, 4.3 uh, million pixels or something? It's just, yeah. 
It, it's when you look through it, it's it's absolutely stunning. In what the design, design uh, we decided to be a little bit on the brutal side. Yeah, it's a poof, uh, with an axe, but that was uh, that was. Uh, it will become a, a little bit more elegant in future, but this was a key step to show this is a, a totally different camera system. Well, you you were the first with the joystick. Yep. And what a joy it is when you're, I guess that's why they call it the joystick, yeah. when you're focusing and being able to move the focus points. It makes to, a lot of sense. Wow, it makes yeah. a, a great amount of sense. Yeah. GPS built right in and yeah. just the whole yeah. feel for it. Um, so it's, it's the lens is a bit on the huge side, yeah, but that has to do with the decision 24 to 90, mm. which usually you don't do. Usually you do 28, 75 or so, but suddenly becomes smaller. So here going uh, right into wide angle. And even the the 90 to 280, you, you went rather than stop at 200, you went up to 280, and you know we've stretched almost to 300 millimeters. That's a yep. great yeah. uh, zoom factor. So design-wise, you can't probably uh, design them much smaller, unfortunately. No, but it's a, it's, it's a fine size, and it fits nicely into the, the product line. And having and doing workshops all over the world, uh, I run into this with my participants all the time, and they mm -hmm. really are beginning yeah. to you know, embrace this, especially because there are more lenses coming now. So that's going to be quite nice. Let's kind of change gears a minute. We've talked a lot about cameras and lenses and you know, some of the great things going manufacturing-wise, but two things that I noticed that are very different, and you, you believe very much in educating your customers, and you know, you've got the academy, yeah. but more than anything else, too, you, there's no Nikon store or Canon store. You have stores. So, What's this all about? Where, where did simple. the store part come in? And then let's get. We the had at the beginning some uh, help by Hermes, who at this time still was a shareholder. And for the store concept, we had for two years the former marketing manager of Hermes, because we, as we decided for this concept, it was very clear a Leica has to be presented in a, in a certain environment. And you know, the typical mom and pop stores are dying, yes, especially in the US. Yeah, yeah, and suddenly you have these big, uh, huge B&H, Adorama, Best Buy. It's also not a, a, a typical great environment for Leica. So it was very clear, you have to go for dedicated retail as a retail experience. And the first store was opened 2006 in Tokyo, at Ginza, still have it. Design still looks great. And since then, we decided to go more into uh, uh, retail, which is also a, a shift of the mindset. Because originally, a camera producer and the others are still do it. They, they develop, they produce, and then they throw it into distribution, and that's not uh, quite often not owned by them. And then the distribution throws it somewhere in the retail pipeline, and that's also not. So you can't control your brand. In our case, it's necessary to control our brand because it's a high-end brand. It's a uh, brand with a certain heritage. It should not be, uh, you know, uh, today discount 50%, something like this. Um, so it was a necessary step and I think the right step. You hear a, a lot of discussion nowadays about brick and mortar dying, etc. From what I see in the US, part of the dying brick and mortar has to do that the companies are owned by private equity companies and they usually put all the debt into the company and then it dies somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so um, doing retail the right way, and we're trying to do this, we're, we're still in a, a bit of a learning curve. Retail as an experience that you see your brand, you feel it, uh, it's, it's a sort of creating relationship with human beings. And digitally you can use for information, great, maybe ordering some cheap stuff, but to create a relationship with people, which are your respected customers, you only really can do this via retail. So that's my strong belief. Well, you know, sitting here in the Leica store here in Wetzlar, and you've got one in Frankfurt, which is beautiful, and many others in the U.S., it's, it's a great place to go. You, know, you feel like you just want to stop by for coffee and touch the cameras. But if there's one thing we've repeated throughout our videos that we've done over the last few days is the fact that you got to get in there and hold this. Yeah. You know, it's sort of like, oh, and all of a sudden you begin to feel it and see it. And so I think you're, you're dead on in regards to uh, that approach. You have to be always careful uh, when you invest too much into 
uh, brick and mortar. Yeah. Yeah. But um, to do it the right way, which ho hopefully we're doing, uh, you can create much, I would say, stronger customer reaction, which at the end means also someone who buys something, because at the end, the customer pays our bills. Yes, yes. So the, the other aspect of that, obviously, is, is the academic side of things. You do an awful lot to educate your customers. Um, there's workshops and different things along the lines, and you've got classrooms in this new building, which are just incredible. So tell me where, where, what that it thought It started process. way back in 1932 with, uh, at this time it was called Leica Schule, Leica School. <laughs> so we upgraded yeah, to Academy. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, so uh, we think even in, in these days, or you could say especially in these days when everybody is a photographer due to the smartphone, you need to understand how to create better photography, how to create photography where at the end you have a look at it and think, that looks good. Yeah? Because um, nowadays everybody shoots snapshots. Yes. That, that, that's great. Yeah? Because you always have it around. So everybody's a photographer, nobody knows what's photography. How do you compose? How do you use light? And a few other things. And that's why we see Academy, Academy, as a, as a very valuable tool for, company, for the company and the customer. Well, I, I think that plays a big part because you're concerned about the customer, you're concerned about the, you know, the, the craft of the photography and you've done a great job. But diversing a little bit from that, let's talk about your wife for a second because I had a chance to meet her briefly and listen to her mm -hmm. uh, speak at Photokina, the last Photokina, which yeah. was uh, what, just about a year 16, ago. Yeah. Yep. And she's doing an amazing thing with photography. And she is working with photographers. And she had produced, uh, along with somebody else, I believe, who was part of that, the most amazing display at Photokina Photography, I think, I've uh, ever that, seen. That, that was really a cool, uh, cool exhibition. Unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, it was like, oh, God, if you could just put this, you know, every major city and have people experience it, it was just gorgeous. So tell me where that came in. It must be well, so much fun to work with started, a wife in this. She started 2008 when we opened the, um, our, our Leica Gallery in Salzburg. Because at this time, inside the company was decided to kill the Leica Galleries. Oh, really? <laughs> it's not known outside. No, so. okay, and then I said, okay, I'll show you. <laughs> so, and she, uh, at the beginning, she, 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 uh, she, she's not from the gallery scene. So, so we said, okay, let's try it. And we started in Salzburg. And since then, um, well, nowadays we have 18 Leica galleries worldwide because we see this as ne a necessary part of giving younger photographers the possibility to exhibit and also show to customers the high-end part of photography. And uh, she's also doing, so she's curating this, she's overseeing the Leica galleries worldwide and also curating the huge exhibitions like you have here, Eyes Wide Open. Mm -hmm. This uh, travels since 2014 through the world. At the, uh, at the moment it's still in Madrid. It will open on the 15th of November in Rome, showing 100 years of Leica photography. And she did curate this with a few other uh, people like uh, Hans Michael Kötzler, etc. Um, we have a few other um, exhibitions which are traveling. We have a dedicated one for China. It's called China Flight. Mm -hmm. This is a very unusual portfolio because it was shot with a Leica II from a plane in China between 1933 and 1936. Really? Oh. And uh, these pictures are totally unique because nobody in those days was shooting from the plane with a Leica. That was a German pilot flying. Uh, he came from Lufthansa to a Chinese airline and he was shooting three years from his cockpit and he was a great photographer. So. So just every time he got on a plane, he would take yeah. pictures. So roughly 1,500 pictures, a China which nobody has seen. And we, we curated this in 2016, and it's now shown at, at certain parts of China. So we slash she does also these kind of special um, exhibitions. Uh, we're working on two others. Oh, can't wait to see them. Let's wrap up here. Um, one thing that uh, I know our readers would like to know, um, as well as anybody that's buying a Leica, is you know, so much has happened since you've come on board. Your involvement's going to continue in the future. Everybody, I mean, this is, you know, you've, you've 
made a direction here. I have a very simple agreement with my family. I say I work until I'm 75. Okay. So I have enough, quite a few years left. And we also have inside the family installed a certain way how the family will uh, keep on. And on the other hand, my, my, my daughter Laura just started working at CW's on the optic. Excellent. Yeah. So this is marketing there for the Cine lenses. Good. So things are going to continue and just get better. Um, you know, in, in, in life and in economy, you never know. I always uh, take a very, uh, very awful example. You know, if another idiot has this idea to fly with, uh, with a plane into a skyscraper, wow. yeah, you never know. Yeah. So in economy, you, sometimes things do happen. But when you keep this aside, um, the, the plan we have for the next three to five years looks like a pretty sound one. Excellent. As we close, is there anything you'd like to say to our audience? Keep shooting. <laughs> Keep shooting. <laughs> well, yeah. or, the, or the German, you know, the old German photographers still, they have a, a certain way to tell each other. They say, gut Licht, that means uh, have great light. Ah, beautiful. <laughs> yeah, for me, like... you know, when I travel, and I travel a lot, uh, sometimes um, I see something and, and then I, I, I want to capture this. So this feeling, I want to get this. I think that's what we all should do and try to become better. You know, yeah. Henri Cartier-Bresson, the first 10,000 pictures are bad anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so so yeah. one can learn. It, it's hard to explain to people what photography does to you, but there, there is a passion and, you know, it, it's almost... You see things. Yeah, it's, yeah. It, you know, and uh, once people get hooked, they get hooked yeah. and they're big time. Anyway, first off, I hope... Somewhere along the line in the future, I get to sit with you again, and we can pick up on other parts of conversation. You would be definitely invited for June 2018, 14th of June, opening of Lights Park 3, huge event, 1,500 people love invited. To, love to be there. You, you would be on the list. Excellent. And yeah. catch up with the other times. But I want to say thank you. Thank okay. you for making Leica what it is today. Thank you for coming here. Thank, thank you. you for enjoying even the tunnels of Wetzlar. Oh, that was an adventure. <laughs> oh, we learned so much. And... Uh, uh, we, have, we, we have so much to share with our audience. First, thank you for opening the doors, letting us have access to all the things we've had access here to your uh, staff and team and management group. Everybody's just been so gracious to us. And uh, it's been quite an adventure. And um, Chris and I are looking forward now to cutting the, the, the okay. video and putting it together and getting yeah. it out there. So once again, thanks very much. And to all see my readers, yes, yeah. so, see you another time. Yeah. And, I'll and see you on the Lumos Keep shooting. Yeah, keep shooting. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again. Okay. Thank you.